यात्र गंगा गयो नद्या यात्र याच हरे आच्छा सदेश Ganga, Jamuna, Narmada, and Kaviri. Nadia, Sacred Rivers, Puranesu, in the Puranas, Supplementary Vedic Literature, Cha, also, Vishrutaha, are celebrated. Translation in purport by His Divine Grace, A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Jai. Auspicious indeed are the places where there is a temple of the Supreme Personality of Godhead Krishna, in which He is duly worshipped, and also the places where there flow the celebrated sacred rivers mentioned in the Puranas, the supplementary Vedic literatures. 
Anything spiritually done there is certainly very effective. Mm. Purport. There are many atheists who oppose the worship of the deity of the Supreme Personality of Godhead in the temple. In this verse, however, it is authoritatively stated that any place where the deity is worshipped is transcendental. It does not belong to the material world. It is also said that the forest is in the mode of goodness, and therefore those who want to cultivate spiritual life are advised to go to the forest. Vanamgato ya darim asriyeta. But one should not go to the forest simply to live like a monkey. Monkeys and other ferocious animals also live in the forest. But a person who goes to the forest for spiritual culture must accept the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of God as shelter. Vanamgato ya darim asriyeta. One should not be satisfied simply to go to the forest. One must take shelter of the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. In this age, therefore, since it is impossible to go to the forest for spiritual culture, one is recommended to live in the temple community as a devotee, regularly worshiping the deity, following the regulative principles, and thus make the place like Vaikuntha. The forest may be in a mode of goodness, the cities and villages in passion, and the brothels and hotels and restaurants in ignorance. But when one lives in the temple community, he is, lives in Vaikuntha. Therefore it is said here, Shreya Sampadam, it is the most, it is the best, most auspicious place. In many places throughout the world, we are constructing communities to give shelter to devotees and worship the deity in the temple. The deity cannot be worshipped except by devotees. Temple worshippers who fail to give importance to the devotees are third class. They are kanista adhikaris in the lower stage of spiritual life. As is stated in Srimad Bhagavatam 11.247, Archaya Mevahalaye, Puja Yasradaya Hate, Taddad Bhakti Shu Chane Shu Sad Bhakti Prakute Smitaha. A person who is very faithfully engaged in the worship of the deity in the temple, but does not know how to behave toward devotees or people in general, is called a Prakrita Bhakta or Kanista Adhikari. Therefore, in the temple there must be the deity of the Lord. And the Lord should be worshipped by the devotees. This combination of the devotees and the deities create a first-class transcendental place. Aside from this, it is the Grihastha devotee worships the Shalagram Shiva. If the Grihastha devotee worships the Shalagram Shiva, or the form of the deity at home, his home also becomes a very great place. It was therefore customary for members of the three higher classes, namely the Brahmanas, Kshatriyas, and Vaishyas, to worship the Shalagram Shiva, or small deity of Radha Krishna, or Sita Ram, in each and every home. This made everything auspicious, but now they have given up the deity worship. Men have become modernized and are consequently indulging in all sorts of sinful activities, and therefore they are extremely unhappy. According to Vedic civilization, therefore the holy places of pilgrimage are considered most sacred, and still there are hundreds and thousands of holy places, like Jagannath Puri, Vrindavan, Hardwar, Rameshwar, Prayag, and Mathura. India is the place for worshipping or for spiritual cultivation of life. The Krishna Conscious Movement invites everyone from all over the world, without discrimination, as to caste or creed, to come to its centers and cultivate spiritual life perfectly. Om Vigyan Timirandasya Dinajana Sarakaya Chaksu Unmilitam Yena Tasmai Shri Vidavena Maha Shri Chaitanya Mano Bistam Stavdita Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swam Padati Kam Nama Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Sri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Niti Namine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine 
conception of Gita Nagari and uh, he presented it to some important people within the Indian administration in the government wrote a few letters but he patterned his whole paper after the program that Gandhi had developed Gandhi had developed a four-part program in which he won wanted to dis help bring about the caste system. They call it caste, but that's just an, an, you know, a substitute word for class, actually. And then he also wanted to, uh, on a personal level, he was always engaging in reading the Bhagavad Gita and doing his daily prayers. The problem is that although he was a politician, he made his very politician in, on, in, the, in his activities, but he made it a daily, regular feature of his life to every day read the Bhagavad Gita, quote the Bhagavad Gita also in his lectures, and also gave regular prayer sessions for him and others. And then he also wanted to raise people who were on the lower stages, like the Bungis and Chamaras, to higher stages, so they could also be get equal rights in society. It's called the Harijan movement. And another thing is he wanted to do is reopen or reestablish the whole idea of temple worship. So Prabhupada patterned his whole treatise called the Gita Nagari Concept after these principles that Gandhi had uh, tried to establish. And Gandhi did a pretty good job, but once he left, everything got uprooted in terms of uh, his whole idea for independent village programs and self-sufficiency. Prabhupada, in describing the whole idea of the temple movement, he said that the temples years ago referring to the past, were places where people would come and hear about transcendental knowledge from people who are qualified to speak, the Brahmins and others, and they would have an opportunity to worship the deity in association with others. But then Prabhupada said, after some time, things changed, became a a place of demoniac dance, that was the exact words he said. And then later on, in some of his more recent lectures, he says the temples in the area are places where dogs and other animals live. And monkeys live. And so everything has devolved, he might say, or degraded, to a point where the temples now at best, the places where those who run the temples are simply trying to get money from the public in order to uh, keep their griha going. Uh, and you see that even when they establish Hindu temples in the West, like in, in, in America, there's many big cities have Hindu temples there. I've been to many of them and I've given lectures, they've invited me to come, but you see there's all kinds of deities there. But you can feel the atmosphere. There's no the atmosphere is not doesn't have any devotion to it. It's just an ordinary atmosphere. And their worship is they do some puja, 
but they don't do any kind of real offerings. They offer peanuts and some uh, sugarized candy, <laughs> and then they go home and eat pakoras and you know, you know, whatever else they eat, chapatis and puris and all of them. So the deities get peanuts and raisins. And <laughs> so these are this is what happens. <laughs> yeah, I've seen this. Uh, these temples are just, and they have like a, they have every deity in there. Everybody you can think of, and grandpa's on one of the altars also. The, the, the family duty, the grandpa. So temple worship has somewhat devolved and degraded into some kind of business at best, or a place for inhabitants of people who are not interested in worship. So Prabhupada, when he came, he wanted to revive the whole idea of temple movements around the world. So he established Radha Krishna temples. Practically in many places around the world, so many, and it's still going today, places where we, you can come, and as Prabhupada describes it here, that the devotees are the only ones that are qualified to worship the deities, those who are trained in rabbinical culture and have developed rabbinical habits along with the culture. And those who are a second initiated for actual puja, but everyone should come, as Prabhupada said, everyone should come. And because here is the place you can learn about Krishna. Prabhupada's idea for temple worship in the West, in the United States and in Europe, was to make it a place for education. And he writes about that also. He says the temples are not simply a place to come and see the deity, and then offer some pranams and then leave. It's a place to learn about, you know, who Krishna is, who Ram is, what is your relationship with them. In other words, transcendental knowledge. So he said in a few lectures that there should be discourses on transcendental subject matters going on throughout the whole day. And then he said at night, three hours of kirtan. <laughs> He writes that in Chaitanya Tari's in detail. So he had a broad vision for making the temple really the center of the whole community, which was the move in the Vedic culture, at least when Vedic culture was still established. Now things have changed. So the temple is a very valuable place for association, inspiration, getting knowledge, and worshiping and learning about our relationship with Krishna. Nowadays, we even see within our ISKCON society, people are not so enthusiastic to attend temple functions, even when the temples are open. For whatever reason, there may be different reasons, you know, maybe it's distance from the temple or whatever. I don't really have a clear understanding why people don't come. I don't come enough. I would like to come more. Um, but whatever reason, still, these temples are really valuable. And Prabhupada put his heart and soul in establishing and teaching us how we can maintain these temples very nicely. But as he says here, if we follow the principles and worship nicely, then the place becomes like, like Kunta. In other words, it's no longer part of this material energy. Although it's situated within the material energy, it's different. And you'll see, even people who are ordinary, when they come to the temple, they say, oh, there's a nice feeling when you come in here. They feel, you can feel the atmosphere is much different than wherever else they've been, especially if they've been played in sinful places. The more sinful the place, the more heavier the atmosphere is, the more spiritual the place, the more lighter the atmosphere. Feel a sense of lightness, a sense of, of uh, naturalness in the temple atmosphere. So these temples are, we used, to, we used to say that they are like embassies, spiritual embassies. This is the material world. If in a, in a particular country there's an embassy of another country in that country. So when you go to that embassy, Whatever it is, say you're here in Slovenia, so you have the Croatian embassy here. 
you go into the Croatian embassy, you're not under the jurisdiction of Slovenia's rule anymore. You walk into a whole different atmosphere, or a different rule. You change. So in the same way, when we come into the temples, these are spiritual oases as a way to get, take shelter away from the material energy and take shelter of Krishna. There are places in of getting away from the, the hard material energy that is you know, pushing people this way and this way and that way. So temples should be very, very clean. And this was Prabhupada's point many times. He said, keep the temple revolutionary clean. He didn't use the word clean. He added the, the adjective revolutionary clean. So clean that people will say, this place is clean. <laughs> they get an experience. Revolutionary. Yeah, it's like beyond your descriptions. <laughs> and uh, yeah, it's so clean that when you go in, you just think, oh, I don't know what's going on here, but it must be nice <laughs> for new people to come. So it's our job. And one of the first services that devotees used to get when they would join the movement is to clean the temple. Because the temple is also synonymous with the heart. So we would give that service to new people to help them clean their heart. Because they say when you clean the temple physically, you're actually cleaning your heart. It's not just a, you know, a euphemism or some analogy. It's actually true. When you actually clean the temple, you're actually cleaning the dirt from your heart at the same time. And we see how Lord Chaitanya, when he performed at Gundicha Marjan, how, how enthusiastic he was and how that enthusiasm spilled over to all his associates when they were, you know, cleaning the temple so clean that they cleaned everything, including the courtyard, the ceilings, the walls, <laughs> the deity room, the boga room, every, every place in the temple was clean. And then that Chaitanya Mahaprabhu said, I think we should clean it again. Mm -hmm. And then he set up a competition who could get collect the most dirt, would get some Mahaprabhu for Lord Joshua. Of course, Lord Chaitanya won the competition. Mm -hmm. He's always the best in every category. So uh, he showed by example how important it is to keep the temple, when we say, so clean. Because that's another way to invite when the temple is clean and people know they also want to come and be in that atmosphere. Aside from the fact that the activities of the temple that go on. The Prabhupada had a big vision for temple worship. When he first started his movement in America, he said, you know, for our Hare Krishna movement, we could simply chant Hare Krishna in the streets, and we could live in a simple dwelling. He said, like we could preach from underneath the tree. But he said, who would come? Who would come? No one would come. So he said, I, I established these temples in order to invite the public to come and learn about Krishna and learn about devotion to Krishna and learn about the philosophy also. So, so Prabhupada had a big vision for these temples. Sometimes we lose that appreciation for having the atmosphere. We think, oh, I live in the temple. People are living outside. They got more freedom than whatever else they got. <laughs> but actually, it's a, it's a rare thing to live in the temple and to keep up the standards of the temple activity, both on a personal level and on, the, on a broader level. So we want to and the fact that we're refurbishing the temple now is a good indication that uh, this is, we want to do that, make it nicer and cleaner and more attractive in so many different ways. Not only for the general people, but for the devotees in general. It's nice. So uh, this temple worship or the temple part of our worship is a very, very essential thing in cultivating Krishna consciousness. Particularly because the atmosphere in Kali Yuga is so bad. 
that uh, when you go out, you feel the difference. You, just like last night, we had a beautiful kirtan here. And everybody was dancing and doing all kinds of things. And then I was feeling so happy when I was, and I, when I walked out, I walked out into the ice cold, dark street of Croatia. I mean, Slovenia. <laughs> <laughs> I think it was Croatia. And I, and I felt a complete drop in the atmosphere. I was thinking, I gotta get to my place as fast as I can. <laughs> I just don't like being out of here. And that was the feeling. I'm not exaggerating. This is one of my initial experience last night after I left. Then you can feel that. So in, in keeping the temple atmosphere up, um, chanting, dancing, and philosophical discourses, and uh, of course keeping it very clean. These are the energies raised the spiritual energy more and more, and the deity is worshipped nicely. Especially for those, for those of you who cook for the deity, they cook very nicely, keep everything very clean, the Lord is accepting our offering. Everything should be done in the first class manner. The worship should be done in the best possible way. Uh, clean, organized, on time. Bhakti Vinod Thakur, at one time in his life, was made the principal director of the Jagannath Temple in Jagannath Puri. And at that time, prior to him taking that position, there was, things were at a lower standard. But he came in and he changed everything and he organized the offerings to the minute. Because in deity worship, there are two. There are three principles, but two of them are essential, and the third one follows the, uh, the other two. The three principles are cleanliness, punctuality, and simplicity. Those are the three principles of deity worship. So what's most important? Cleanliness and punctuality. These are the most important things. And if we do that, simplicity follows. Simplicity in the sense that it becomes natural and more easily to worship the deity. Uh, putting the offering on the altar right at the exact time, taking the offering off at the exact time, beginning the arches at the same time, ending them, all these things are the details of good, what we say. What we say. Uh, deity worship that was taught to us by Srila Prabhupada. <coughs> Although in this age, deity worship is not the means for self-realization, that was in the previous age, the Torah gave it. Still, Prabhupada said, two rails on the transcendental track. As you have a train, the train has to travel on two tracks. So, Bhagavad Vidyan Pancharatri Gividi, or hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord and reading and studying and discussing scriptures, and two, Worshipping the deity in his transcendental form according to the rules and regulations given. So if we follow these two things, because deity worship helps to develop Brahminical qualities. And when Brahminical qualities are developed, enhanced, then it becomes easier and more natural to understand scripture and to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. So you see how in deity worship, can elevate, to help elevate our consciousness to the mode of goodness. And that's the platform for successful execution of any activity in devotional service, to be, to be acting in the mode of goodness. So this is where the benefit we have. So when we come into the temple, of course, we pay our obeisances to the Vaishnavas, we pay our obeisances to the spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada, and then we pay our obeisances to the Lord. All these are part of the process of respecting the um, mode of temple worship. Shortcutting these things really simply is a sign of not understanding what we have here because temples are really, really wonderful, and especially this particular temple here. 
It's one of the more vibrant temples in, throughout Europe. Pure Krishna Maharaj came to, we were talking one time, he said to me, he said, this temple is the best temple in Europe. That's how he said it. <laughs> and, and I was thinking, let me think of one that's better when he said it. <laughs> and then I couldn't, so I had to agree with him. So yeah, this is a uh, it's a very vibrant temple, and one of the a rare qualities or rare benefits that you have in this temple is that you have Panchatattva, where there's only a few temples around the world that actually are worshiping the Lord in the in the five features in the Panchatattva. There's I think maybe four or five, and maybe I don't can't remember how many, but maybe Maharaj or so many temples we have for Panchatattva, but not many. Most of them are Gordhitai and many Radha Krishna temples like that. But it's really an inspiration for Sankirtan and for chanting. Panchatattva really inspires Sankirtan, they inspire Kirtan, they inspire the mood of chanting more and more. So these, this, these temples are so important. And Prabhupada goes on to discuss another section here. For Grihastas, he says they can stay, they can worship in their homes the Shalagrad Sila or some form of a deity, and that home also becomes like a mandir. The idea is that those living in the home, they should, if they're initiated, they should get permission from their uh, sannyasi spiritual master to worship the deity at home. And then begin deity worship there. And the deity becomes the center of the home. The deity becomes the owner of the home. You're the resident, and the deity is the proprietor. <laughs> You're just living there. It becomes his place. And in that way, you center everything in the family affairs around the deity. Even making decisions within the family could be presented to the Lord. And then this is the actual culture, the Vedic culture, how the deity was consulted in many cases on just ordinary matters or very important matters, and then the decisions will be made by offering prayers to the Lord and praying for his inspiration. So uh, the deity becomes a very, very, what do we say, center of the home also. Like that. So sometimes people say, well, yeah, this is my house. No, <laughs> it's not your house. <laughs> the humble Meti. It belongs to the Lord. And uh, because he's there personally, you have a, a greater obligation in everything you do and how you do it. Like so it's also a great benefit that Prabhupada has established that extension of deity worship with even in the homes like that. So, uh, yeah, we are very fortunate to have this kind of uh, uh, mercy coming. So we should be very grateful for the fact that we have, you know, such a wonderful temple and it has so much potential to become even more and more wonderful. So everyone, every devotee should take part in some activities to help develop the temple, to help keep the temple clean, to worship in some form or another. And that way, it becomes Aikuta. Because in the spiritual world, everyone is engaged in various activities centered around the Lord. Okay. So the class begins in 10 minutes. According to that clock. Up there. This is a future clock. Huh? This is future clock. Oh, future clock. Yeah, for next uh, <laughs> any time. <laughs> okay. It's just time to be ahead of time. <laughs> okay, then it's, we're, only, we're only 11 hours behind. So. <laughs> it's, it's dedicated for fall. <laughs> it's for those who have long arms, they can change the clock. But. So any uh, comments or questions? Anything related to TV worship or temple activity? OK.
Okay, so thank you very much. Shila Prabhupada Ki, Shimas Bhagavatam Ki, Gorakhinam Devi, Shimas Bhagavatam Ki,